but I did want to just, the, the one piece of information which might be interesting to you is that Alan Gray, uh, you'll have noticed the name of the composer of the, of the film score is Alan Gray. And that's quite surprising because one might have expected that uh, one of the leading film composers, British film composers, such as Ralph Vaughan Williams or Arnold Bax or William, William Wong. Yes. Yeah, one of, those, one of those leading names of, of British music associated with you know, landscape imagery already with an established reputation might have been asked. But in fact, Alan Gray uh, is, the, is the, you know, the, the professional name of Josef Zmigrod, uh, who was a Polish composer <laughs> trained under Arnold Schoenberg. Uh, who wrote this uh, score, and he was, uh, he knew Emmerich Pressburger from uh, UFA, the German film consortium in the 1930s, a leading musical figure in the Weimar Republic. So it's actually not the, it's not the kind of indigenous musical product that you might expect, but I think he did an absolutely brilliant job. Where that did seem to come, I mean, uh, th there's this extraordinary moment with the Bach, where you have to deal with the, uh, the, the fact that the cathedral is filled not with English music. We have the English choral music, William Byrd choral music being practiced by the choir who we never see. And that's the authentic medieval English product. That's the pure product. But then Bach comes in on the organ and really complicates this very straightforward identification of uh, English music as kind of authentic. Um, uh, which, we've, which we've been living with up to that point. We have the pilgrims initially introduced with the, with the medieval chant um, uh, and, uh, and so on. But then with Bach, the music both signifies transcendental uh, you know, transfiguration, the shafts of light through the Gothic window, the organ fulfillment, and then it also signifies Germanness. And the same music as we move outside when we hear Leopold Stokowski's orchestration of that Bach piece, it moves seamlessly from the organ into the orchestra. We're then dealing with Bach as German, and we actually, we're, we're surveying the bombed streets of Canterbury with the same music, the Toccata and Fugue in, in D, moved into the orchestra, and suddenly it signifies Luftwaffe. Um, so I think that's one of the most brilliant moments of sort of aural trans, trans, well, confusion, really, or sort of transition uh, that you find in the film. And it's a quite a brilliant move then to transit back into those bells, which are you know, authentic, forged by the kind of same guy that we saw in the, in the blacksmith's shop, you know, whacking away at his, piece of, at his piece of iron as his predecessors had done. So I did think that that, that sounds great. And then, of course, there's a sort of Glenn Miller moment in there as well. So the, the, the use of sound to you know, construct a cultural idiom is the thing that I, I really noticed this time. But I'm sure everyone else has got different themes that they'd like to bring. bring okay, would you like to yes. offer an initial response? Um, sure. Um, I guess this is interesting what you say about the cathedral, and I guess it reminds me of Mrs. Miniver, uh, a Hollywood film that was, uh, however, starring Ger Garson and uh, also very popular in Britain, which was about uh, the Blitz and the the kind of coming of war and what it meant, and a lot of that there's a there's a kind of weepy Christmas scene in a in a ruined church whose roof has come off and everybody is kind of congregating there celebrating. Um, this film is also made at the same time that in Germany, whose war was going less and less well at this point, uh, there are films also set in ruined buildings and ruined cathedrals, which are kind of deeply melancholic films about the end of the world coming and how one sort of preserves. And this film is very idyllic in comparison to those things. Um, I also wanted to just add that actually the number of German and German Jewish emigres involved in this film seems to be quite extensive. Alfred Junge uh, did the photography or the or maybe the mise en scène, and he's a very well known um, designer who um, is one of those links that Kirsty mentioned with uh, German expressionism in the Weimar Republic. I also just wanted to say something about this in conjunction to Paul and Pressburger's films in general. Some of you may know, I know where I'm going, a slightly earlier, uh, more romantic, even blither film about the war, which is set in the Highlands and also um, the voice of the old prophecy which speaks, uh, and there's also a sense of the palimpsestic, it also uses the falcon, it also uses a sense of a kind of buried feudal past that's kind of under everything. Um, but they go on after the war to make Peeping Tom, and I would just like to point out that that is in this movie too. And um, there is something, I, I've 
always been riveted but sort of vaguely horrified by this film, which I think is a very interesting and weird amalgam of, you know, the wholesome, patriotic, here's Britain as a kind of cultural palimpsest, and, like, what is wrong with this sexually frustrated man who is wreaking this petty... I mean, they, they take a lot of pains to tell us this is trivial, but it's not trivial. He's kind of defacing women to try to drive them out to create a preserve where he can give men a patriotic education. And as the as our land girl says briskly, well, did you ever imagine that inviting the women to come and participate in the kind of patriotic education held in the museum? Oh no, no, he hadn't he hadn't really thought of that. And of course he's hoping that she will end up being the love interest, but uh, you know, miraculously and kind of counterfactually, her dead fiance comes back to life and is there at the end of the film after the film's, what seems to me the film's most poignant scene where she's opening the caravan, which is this carefully sealed off place of past Idol and it's moth eaten and falling apart and she realizes she's really, really lost him. He's died years ago now. It's never coming back and of course a few minutes later he is back. Um, which means that there's this leftover person, uh, this pervert who is going to have to go and you know, he could have been redeemed by the antiquarian girl, you know, wearing coveralls. That could have, that could have sort of started another chapter going but um, that's kind of gone. So anyway, um, and I guess just one, one last uh, word, since you had mentioned um, these other studios, including um, the, um, the uh, Private Life of Henry VIII, the Alexander Corda, which is, of course, a Viennese uh, kind of style brought into British cinema. In a way, um, even at the beginning of the film, the evocation of the Canterbury Pilgrims, this is done in a kind of style of ribald jollity, which is really associated with that studio. So you have this kind of Viennese studio that comes and makes these films about English history. They also make the, Alexander Corda also makes the famous Rembrandt biography, which is a very beautiful humanist film, but also, you know, lust for life. And somehow that's here as the epitome of Englishness. And it's it's weird that you have that as an undertone. I do think you're right, it's there in the music. At the same time that with the the man from Oregon and the girlfriend who's been posted to Australia, you have a kind of cosmopolitan sphere of the English-speaking world kind of radiating out from Britain over the long term and now weirdly kind of centering back on Canterbury, now used as a troop send-off place, which I can't imagine is actually, I can't imagine there was actually an official troop send-off from inside the cathedral. Maybe, maybe there was, uh, but... Yes, I think so. There yes, was. Yes, ah. It's not far from Dover. Uh -huh. And of course, no separation of church and state. So right. There you are. Right. Yes, okay. Could I say yes, please? Yes. Speak? Yes. yes. Um, the the I I too stumble over the uh, Eric Portman, the Esquire, and it's it's it uh, it is a uh, now it appears to us as rather repulsive, his his misogyny, um, and let, let me lay that to one side for a second. He, 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 what's also David, can you difficult? Speak a little closer sorry, to the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. What's also difficult is his Heideggerian view of the world. Mm -hmm. um, that this this is pr profoundly about roots of place, mm -hmm. and you know if you have a caravan, well then you're not a civilized person. Right. Obviously. Right. Obviously. Right. You're like a so so th th there are grounds for being ideologically suspicious of, 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 of this gentleman. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it's very interesting what you said about the cosmopolitan, the sense of uh, kind of, because of course the, I, I don't know, you may have said, I came back, I came in too late. I may have missed something you said in the introduction, but the, the sergeant who was an actor who, who was actually touring in a play of Thor in Thornton Wilder's Our Town, uh, an official American arts play. Um, but he gave his salary for this film to the NAACP. Um, I, I find it one of the most extraordinary statements of 
what can we say? Democratic socialism, mm -hmm. patriotic, national patriotic socialism. It's, I know those are, de you see, put those words together, there's a danger yeah. inherent even when I yeah. put those words together. It's very, very difficult. And it's also so overwhelmingly emotional, I try and stay away from, from this as I stay away from Humphrey Jennings films because mm -hmm. they are so powerful emotionally. If you're English, they're, they're very dangerous films indeed. Yeah. Could I just say something about that squaring of German music? Mm -hmm. and, Please, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it comes up again in Humphrey Jennings' uh, Listen to Britain. Mm -hmm. I sorry, have you been no, talking no, about no. that? I, I, um, when um, we, we hear Dame Myra, Myra Hess <laughs> uh, playing in an empty national gallery and um, a voiceover, we are told that this, this is a German composer. And this is something we may have to think about yes. after the war. Right. And so it's putting all these contra... I think what's so extraordinary about this is it's putting repulsive ideologies of patriarchy, mm -hmm. of place yes. and nation and racial identity, together with the most um, transcendent themes of liberation as well. And, I, I, I find it an extremely difficult film to, to, uh, to deal with. Um, uh, um, the, the other thing is the Heideggerian bit, the deracinated life that we hear about Dennis Price, wonderful actor who, who plays, in a, plays a, in, a, in, a, in a cinema. But it's all right. These people have been blessed and saved. Mm -hmm. right? By this experience, so it, so there is this this redemptive, uh, strong redemptive element in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I hope this mic's going to work now. Um, <coughs> yeah. Before we open it out, I'd like to just respond to some of those comments, and particularly um, what you say, Katie, about the, the sexual violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we've all kind of noted, and this wasn't lost on critics at mm -hmm. the time. And it's actually really interesting to connect this to other extremely violent films at the time. Um, when you look at this film, the, the war is in some ways so completely absent from it. The only scene we have of combat is this kind of ersatz children's warfare, which actually was cut from the American version, interestingly. Um, so this seems to be kind of the only place that we see any conflict. Um, and one would be tempted to think of this as censorship in some way. And yet, if we think about this in relation to a film like Went the Day Well, which I don't know how many of you have seen this, but you know, you have the vicar's wife gunning down German paratroopers with a machine gun. You have a housewife butchering um, German invaders with a meat cleaver. It's actually really graphic. Um, film like the Gainsborough melodramas as well. We have women cross-dressing um, and committing armed robbery. Um, so it wasn't really this question of censorship, but audiences really found the women having sticky stuff squirted into their hair yeah. in the night <laughs> yes. extremely distasteful. And when Peeping Tom came out in 1960, mm. people said, aha, this was a red flag. Right. We should have known Powell was a pervert yeah. from day one. And it's actually really hard not to see Culpepper as an analog for Powell, particularly with him standing in that sort of you know, as I said, this sort of reflective cinematic moment of him presenting the slide lecture and um, expounding on the role of explicitly movies in cultural life. Um, so it's, it is interesting that critics at the time did find it extremely distasteful, and this didn't do well at all at the box office, which is in part why it was recut for American audiences. And maybe if we have time, we'll watch um, the opening yeah, of the American film, because it's so interesting just how different the tone is. But maybe we could... Um, I can sort of run out with the mic and we could open it out if people have questions or comments. Um, we, have mic too. we have another mic. Maybe I can just get past the arm. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? <laughs> I'm wondering about uh, the noir qualities. Um, because certain things come to mind when the term is used, and certainly the shadows and the lighting and all of these things made me think of Fritz Lang, specifically like Ministry of Fear, which is definitely more violent and set in London. Um, 
But what about that? Because I was, I guess I was like, I was anticipating more violence <laughs> and, and yeah. sort of cloak and dagger, espionage, something like that. So. Yeah, if, if I could respond, um, and interestingly, just a, an anecdotal thing that Fritz Lang later recalled watching um, Ministry of Fear on television and falling asleep and saying it was one of his <laughs> worst films he ever made. Um, but the point is well taken. Um, and that's something I, I sort of wanted to touch on in the introduction, that I think it's really easy just to say that noir happens because you have German expressionists making movies and that Canterbury Tale could almost be used as an example of that because we do have, as Katie mentioned, um, so many emigres, European emigres, Hungarian, German, um, working on the film. And I think this really complicates that idea of um, noir as just a product of kind of um, a second generation expressionist cinema. Um, and thinking about if in the American context it's very much a paranoia over the state of the industry, what does it mean for Britain to have this also, you know, similar noir style? And there were, you know, film noir proper, the, the, the British Arts Centre actually did a series of British film noir. Um, and this doesn't sit that easily with that description. Um, so I, I think it is really interesting you know, in a way that T uh, Antonia Lant has done to think about noir as kind of a condition of the everyday in Britain, that everyday life suddenly becomes like living in a film noir. And so yeah. it's almost, um, even though we overprivilege realist cinema in Britain, to think about how this is realist rather than expressionist, a reflection of the actual scenario of blackout. Um, but maybe the rest of you have responses to that. Well, I do think there's a way of thinking about, um, I mean, why is expressionism what it is in the first place? Well, you know, it's a, it's a pre-war German movement, which is about um, existential angst and panic even before the war. Then it's magnified by the war, and then it's um, enormously successful commercially. It becomes kind of the visibly German export style, and so that's one of the reasons it's sort of exported. But a lot of the noir films are actually about the effects of the war on the German economy, the inflation, and so on. So basically, it becomes a style which is often used either to describe like sheer horror, gothic horror, or you know, fantasy films, monster films of various kinds, or it's being used to describe the kind of shadowed nature of daily life in the early 20th century. And as such, it's a helpful shorthand to think either about you know, the creeping menace of German fascism and how it's contaminated British life and or spread its way across Europe, turning everything into a miserable, defeated Germany equivalent, or it's seen more universally. And I, I, I think that in Listen to Britain, the effect of, to my mind, the effect of having um, De Meyer Hess playing the, British, playing the German composers, it's not really anticipating a moment where the Germans will come, they'll wipe everything out, they'll wipe our culture out, and they'll be imposing their culture instead, because she's playing, I think, Beethoven and... Um, so there's this, and Schumann and Beethoven. So there's a sense, these, this is a piece of universal cultural heritage, yes. Yes. and there's a good Germany, and there's an evil Germany, and we have to kind of keep them separated out. And of course, the emigres tried hard and to a degree fruitlessly to keep making that distinction. We are the other Germany, we are mm. not that Germany. Mm. So in a way, you could see the use of this German style as a kind of shorthand for German-imposed existential despair. In a way, you could think of it as a style which helps people in other other but related situations think about um, underlying deep moral anxieties, theological anxieties, um, existential anxieties, you know, both before, during, and after the war. David, did you have Well, I, I think um, if it is neo-noir, or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we'll start again. If it is, uh, partakes of noir, it, it also, a chunk of this is English antiquarian. Yes. Mm -hmm. A, a yeah, very yeah, big yeah, chunk yeah. of... Um, he, he clearly either is a champion of the Council for the Preservation of Rural England. Yeah. He's also, there's hints of he's an ABCA person. He educates the troops. Yeah. That's that. But what he's educating them with is not your Britain, fight for it now, and you get a new health centre or a right. hospital or all the things we mm. saw. Uh, you'll get some you know, further excavations on the hill back yes. there, <laughs> uh, which are bound to... But that, that seems very important, the, the, the idea of 
the opening up of, of, the, of an English past. And that's why I selected that Alan Sorrell image mm. of the, the, the cabin in the, in the clouds. And what's seen below is actually a piece of, of modern engineering. Mm. It's an airfield. But on the other hand, uh, given it's Alan Sorrell, it just as well might be part of uh, uh, an old Roman town that's been reconstructed underneath. So that idea of layers of history um, is, is, and of finding a lyrical style that will do that for you and a narrative that will do that for you, um, that's what, one of the things that's interesting in the film. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting to think about this in terms of propaganda cinema. Um, this was the fourth or fifth um, film about the war that Powell and Pressburger made. Um, and if we think about it in relationship to things like the 49th Parallel, which won an Oscar, um, which was so explicitly propagandistic to try and um, get America involved in the war. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, um, German soldiers kind of go on a killing spree through Canada and then find refuge in neutral America. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's very explicitly about trying to get America into the war. But um, you know, Pressburger said, and I have this quote, he says, Goebbels considered himself an expert on pro propaganda, but I thought I'd show him a thing or two. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's actually really hard to think about this in terms of propaganda. It's so, so complicated compared yeah, to some yeah. of those more explicit films that are being made yes. at this time. Um, so other questions, comments, or Tim? Yeah. Well, I just can I just add one little thing, but, but I don't want to lose these, these comments. It's just that the, uh, the, the sort of uh, extraordinary chiaroscuro of dark and light, because mm -hmm. there, there are the mm -hmm. noir moments, which are probably, what, one third of the film, which is literally when it's dark yeah. or when you're inside. <laughs> and then the rest of the film is this euphoric, mm -hmm. slightly overexposed images of the English countryside mm -hmm. in the most, you know, this, this Maytime blossom and the clouds. And, the clouds. Yeah. Um, and, and with the ruins nestling within the mm. clouds. And that aesthetic is the aesthetic of the English picturesque watercolor. And of course, it's really, yeah. it's so 1790s. And of course, seen against the backdrop of this conference, there were, there were hundreds of moments which yes. triggered yes. the images. There was the skull yeah. under the yes. field. Yes. There was... Mm. There was uh, the Samuel Palmer-esque yeah. night scene. There was the, um, the, the the trailing clouds that you talked about. Yeah, those those, on, those kind of marks in the air, et cetera, et cetera. So really, you know, there's a panoply of everything the visual art is doing mm. is mm. happening here as well. There's an interesting slip of the image, as the French mm. used to, the French <laughs> cinema historians used to say, where we we the camera comes up. And we see hundreds of barrage balloons. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And it's repeated, yeah. and there are contrails yeah. mm -hmm. swerving around. Because, of course, what, what, what it, the war has been sealed off, although the war has entered for the English living in the southeast mm -hmm. quadrant of, of Britain, the, almost the most deadly phase. Mm -hmm. More people will die in the missile attacks, mm -hmm. of, um, which begin in um, June, July. 1944, only end in March, April of 45. And there, those balloons are there to try and stop the V-1 missiles. Right. They're, they're um, against the V-2, which comes on stream in the autumn, there is no defense. We've entered, although the nuclear weapons are not being used, but we've entered the, the nuclear age of bombardment. And it's, it is, it, it's, it's a terror, and I, I think of the fragility of, of that life and the balloons trying, <laughs> trying yes. to ward off this, this yeah. appalling threat. Yeah. And, um, because, of course, some, a town like Antwerp falls under missile mm -hmm. attack as well and is mm -hmm. very badly damaged. And, yeah. um, I think we have a question or a comment. Please. Yeah, I, I was really struck by, you know, they, they're all redeemed in the end, yeah. the, the three main characters. Uh, you know, with uh, with Culpepper really performing the role of the director, he's there, yeah. you know, presiding when she mm. finds the the caravan and then finds that her lover's alive and all that is, is that's the miracle, and she is restored to legitimacy by the by the future father-in-law. But mm. before that, the caravan really is the scene of premarital sex. Yeah. That's yeah. that's yeah. that's yeah. stated throughout. And the, the British sergeant who talks about playing cards with the boys and doesn't have a female partner and is an artist and so on, you know, has all the connotations of a 
gay man mm. who is given you know equal sympathy and uh, equal uh, stature, and of course she, Allison, is you know this radiant figure who is a renegade from conventional morality, and I think despite the, the you know the metaphysical ending. The, what's preceded it, in fact, is very sympathetic toward people's individual lives, especially as they may have been disrupted in wartime. Mm -hmm. But I was really amazed by that because that's the kind of thing you didn't usually get away with in a, in a mainstream <laughs> film. I have to say, though, I had a very weird experience about 15 years ago. I was on an alumni cruise of the Danube with Yale and Chicago alums. And one of the more outspoken people, everybody talked about the war all the way down the Danube. And one of the more outspoken women said to me, just blowing my mind, you realize that everybody here who's talking about the war, they all had premarital sex. Of course they did. They're their boyfriends were about to go off and get killed. Of course they had premarital sex. Forget what your mother intimated to you about what happened. It's all completely misleading. And that was a very demystifying moment. And I, I do think the film sets it up so that we understand it in something like that context. They were engaged for three years. If only they could have been married, then they would have been able to have a normal conjugal life, which was blessed. They weren't able to get married, so hence, you know, she accompanied him to his work and then saw him off at the front. He died. Luckily, she had had that time with him. So there's a lot of explanatory framework about this. But I, I and I do think the interesting thing is that Culpepper is also sympathetic to this. Mm. So despite the mm. fact he is phobic about women and phobic about their, you know, their uh, their ability to drain men of their vital education-seeking powers, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> you know, even he concedes, well, this made sense given this life and death situation that people were in. And there is, after all, that, that weird scene in the train where they're saying, uh, you know, and they talk about, well, shouldn't girls get to have fun? Mm -hmm. And I do think one of the f weird things about this film is it's almost like a feminist detective film, oh, like yes, a kind of feminist yes. detective film of all d'etre. You know, there were those films of the 70s where the women go around interviewing other women, trying to figure out what do women want. And in a way, you know, there's a kind of relay of women who are finding one another and comparing notes and people, and women in all walks of life who are somehow banding together to... Uh, you know, pin down who this perpetrator is, and that's that. And and that Allison's attitude is, I'm not going to let it scare me. I'm annoyed and I'm angry, and um, so it's a kind of militant. I refuse to let this scare me out of town or anything like that. I'm not going to be budged by this. You think I haven't seen worse than this? This is mm. a kind of petty tyranny, and you know we're dealing with. Yeah. 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 Sorry. There's only one. Mm. So what does that mean, that her lover came up from the dead? And the sergeant was a carpenter. So I kept on seeing the carpenter, Catherine, with the wheel, and all of a sudden in the church, in real life. And then uh, Allison is walking with the thought, and the sun has risen up from the dead. Mm -hmm. So I saw a little mm -hmm. bit of that. Maybe I'm just being overly. Why was she so, they were so specific at the time, the wheel. Well, in a way, this is a film that's suffused with religious imagery. I mean, the it, Canterbury and the quest for Canterbury's. So I think there's absolutely something to that. And it, and it doesn't exactly all cohere, but there's a way in which we're supposed to be opening ourselves to a kind of mystical frame of mind where things that would otherwise be seen as coincidences or far-fetched do take on this aura of the miraculous. And I think you're right. There's all this preparation in all kinds of different ways for that eventual... Uh, kind of shift of register in the film. Yeah, yeah I think often in Pal and Pressburger's films, what could be read as religiosity is more spiritualism, 
as a counter against materialism, yes. if that makes yes. sense. Yes. Particularly in things yes. like I Know Where I'm Going, that it's a narrative about a girl who wants to marry incorporated chemical industries yes. and realises that actually what she wants is to live the simple life in the Scottish islands and highlands. And that even has a comparable scene. There, there's the moment when the, the everybody's in the train car and they're going towards Canterbury and they say, oh, well, he wouldn't have a halo and he turns and he does have a halo. Yes. There's a yeah. similar moment and I know where I'm going, which is very... A, a kind of surrealist sequence where they're in the train station and this representative of consolidated chemicals kind of turns in his hat, his top hat, you know, ejects smoke as if he's a devil. And <laughs> there's a kind of hellish whiff of sulfur emanating from him in a film that's otherwise realist. So there's a similar kind of touch, I think. And, you know, you get the train and the people and the pilgrimage together and you can kind of conjure up a bits and pieces of this much older cultural framework. Yeah. Um, Eric, do you have a question? Yes, I, I, I just find myself thinking, uh, David, David already mentioned um, uh, place and uh, Heidegger and, and, and that's a problematic uh, notion of place that seems to be uh, part of the film. I think that's very much true. Um, but I also wonder if um, uh, there's a way in which this film is also um, in part problematizing uh, sense of place. For instance, I wonder about the role of the American, which seems to be primarily uh, to be lost, right? Uh, there's also the scene with the village idiot, which is most, one of the darkest uh, shots in, in the film. Um, and one of the first words that pops out of their mouth is topography. And they're looking around and wondering where to go. Um, and even as the film approaches its end, uh, there seem to be, uh, and this, I think this is true, that there seems to be an acceleration of uh, different angles, uh, different, you know, the, the crane shots going, uh, piercing the cathedral, an inversion of uh, the, the direction of the camera. Um, and of course, Canterbury itself is not the end of the journey here, right? The people are going off in different directions. So it, it just seems to me that, there, that, um, that, that I, I wonder if there's, a, a, there's a, an importance to this kind of quality of um, losing place uh, in the film and losing a sense of... Um, um, orientation and sort of yeah. knowledge of... Well, in a way, the, that album that David showed of the... I mean, I'm sure you picked this partly thinking that the film was coming, right? I that, have to confess. Yes, that. right. And, <laughs> and, and, and I, I kind of primed... Yeah, right, including the, 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 the skewed yeah. cottage and the the narrow streets. And so in a way, it's, you know, Uncle Josh goes to the picture show. It's the skewed yeah. rube vision of things which which we start with only to move into this other ground. Um, uh, Mickey Powell was um, regarded his main influence uh, wasn't German cinema, it was Rudyard Kipling. Yes, right. mm. <laughs> and and Kipling, Kipling, uh, and again, Kipling, who, who went violently out of fashion because of his perceived imperialism, um, but nevertheless, somebody, Kipling, who who wants to see spiritual currents mm -hmm. running through things mm -hmm. that, that cut through uh, history and cuts through, and this is crucial, geographic, global yeah. sites. Right. So that it, whether it's India or Africa or wherever. So Kipling is an, an imperial mm -hmm. figure, um, but, but also in a positive light of, of, of seeing the globe as a set of interconnections and, and there's uh, also yeah. Puck of yeah. uh, Pook's Hill, which yes, is a kind of it. palimpsestic text at the turn of the century, which is quite in, now kind of forgotten, but quite yeah. influential, which again has this sense of all these residues. I just wanted to also raise the issue of these children. I <laughs> guess I'm um, haunted by this, partly because it's my perception that um, children, uh, children's writing about both wars, I, I, I wrote an article at one point about um, the, the stark contrast between children's writing about war in the British context and in the German context. In the German context, already narratives of World War I are semi-apocalyptic, and there's mm -hmm. always a sense of how incredibly dark it is, and people go back to the Thirty Years' War and to Grimmelshausen and to you know, apocalyptic texts to kind of find a way to describe what's happening. And British narratives, especially of World War I, but even of World War II, are very influenced by Baden-Powell, you know, the, the, the hero yeah. of Mafeking and 
the Boy Scouts and the uh, the Boer War energies in the sense that children are going to be mobilized as a kind of militia and that it's a game and that uh, so the fact that this ends with a football game with the, or a soccer game with the children playing and with the sense children are fanning out kind of reenacting war, but that's actually cute. It's not violent or disturbing or scary or a sign of how traumatized they are. It's a kind of miniaturization of war and an idolization of war. I, to me, that's a striking aspect of the film, which mm. isn't merited by the overall situation where, mm. as the Life magazine cover suggested, you know, there were many, many orphan children, traumatized children, um, Anna Freud had set up oh these God, special yes. clinics yeah. trying to deal with uh, children who had been buried under buildings and how to kind of bring them back to health and uh, people who had lost family members. It's, I, or even just thinking about, you know, what would you do if your family member after an air raid was put onto a hospital train and vanished? How would you figure out where they were? That would be so existentially terrifying. So if we think about what the civilian situation was like on the ground, which was mm. deeply chaotic and confusing, this does not get at that at all. It's so, on some other plane altogether. I ask a question to follow up on that, um, especially that scene, children playing war, and just kind of ask maybe um, in terms of the British context, whether that particular image, children playing war, becomes um, a trope. And as, uh, as if I understood it right, it was cut for the American context, which I find very interesting because in the, in the American context, you do find this kind of trope of children playing war as this kind of cocteau-like enfant terrible. Yeah, you see it I in I Philip Guston, you see it in Chilichev. Yeah. So I find it really interesting that it gets cut. And so I was wondering if you can speak mm -hmm. to the difference of perception that would happen in relation to that scene in British and American yeah. context. Um, the, the, the key uh, film to think about here, immediately post-war, is um, an Ealing film called Hue and Cry, where gangs of, and they appear to be orphan, they have, have, right. of inner city London kids play in the Blitz and play at various games. Then, rather like Emil, a borrowing from Emil and, and the, the Detectives, detectives yeah. Yeah. they then uh, take part in rounding up criminals, thieves <laughs> and people, but, but we see them, very poignant shots of them running around in the ruins. As, it, it's as if we were in Naples, you know, and they're, they're street children. Um, uh, and you were absolutely right, thinking of Puck of Pook's Hill. Um, I know I've been, I've brought, dragged in various personal anecdotes, but while I was working on Paradise Lost and Mickey Bow was still alive, and um, I brought my son to, to see him and we were talking, and he said, he asked me if I did I read Puck of Pook's Hill to Leo, my son, and I said yeah, and he, and he did something, and it feels as startling as some of the images in the film. He said, "Then I bless you both," wow. mm. <laughs> which feels as if it's out of that narrative, yeah. and it it took us aback. But we were also, you know, I'm sure there was, somewhere there was a blinding, there was a bolt of light. <laughs> so, um, but he was an extraordinary person. Mm. And that's why I, I feel I cannot wholly join in a condemnation mm. of, of elements here. We, we are dealing with a set of contradictions. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah, and maybe just speaking about the, the American version, I understand that it was largely cut to squeeze it down to fit better into a double feature. Um, and that that was one scene that didn't contribute too much to the plot. Mm. You could cut it, it wouldn't affect it too much, which actually, see, I mean, to me, that seems like such an important allegorical mm. scene. It's interesting that that's, mm. that's what they chose to trim out. Um, I don't know if, if people want to see the, we have sort of a, a short clip from the opening of the American version, which I just think it's so interesting. Um, yeah. If we could get, um, it's on this disc, American version excerpts, if I can sort of, I think it's really interesting that still in the American version you get the, the Kubrick match cut. Yeah. yeah. Um, that I, I just have to believe that he saw that. And that's where... Oh, my mic's on. Um, that's also, where the 2001... Yeah. When was that released? 49. But also so much for English history. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. See, I was, really, I was really keen for everyone to see that because that blew my mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, also the fact... So... 
a whole plot strand has no suspense left in it whatsoever. That's okay. also right. the effect of it. Yeah, the, the, the miracle so, is revealed yeah. in the opening shot. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about that? Um, you might recognize Kim Hunter as uh, the American uh, love interest in A Matter of Life, a matter of life or Death, mm. um, which is another interesting film to think about in relationship to, um, you know, in the same boat as a theme and um, the extensive trial at the end about sort of the morality of a, an Anglo-American relationship. But um, any other questions or comments? I did just wonder how the politics of the film would play in America, because, I, I mean, it's, it's, and, you know, David, I'd like to hear your, your much more, more well and better informed thoughts on this, but it has a kind of fascinating uh, sort of 19th century Tory uh, kind of political worldview. Well, I mean, because, you know, you, you invoke the health service, and, and there's so many of these war films have a kind of sense of everyone coming together to form a new polity in the face of adversity. And there's absolutely not a hint of that here. The idea that the society is being transformed, you know, it's, it's absolutely more that the, the kind of, it's like some mid-Victorian uh, F.D. Morris, for example, the, the, the uh, Christian socialist who said that if only you realize that everyone has their place in earth and that God is revealed to us through the, through the church, you know, every, everything will be fine. Um, it's, just, it's just extraordinarily resistant to the kind of collectivist politics of the exact moment that we're talking, the beverage report. I mean, this is the exact same day. Well, not only that, but it seems to sort of reinforce, it seems to sanction and reinforce the misogynist strains of the film. I mean, you know, the the couples who are married are fighting. Oh, yes, I promise you, because we weren't married yet. Now we are married. I mean, this is yes. it's it's fairly just, hideous, actually. Yeah. There's a, there's a moment which you hardly hear. You have to be primed to hear. But when the sergeant goes into the wheelwright's mm -hmm. workplace, I, you may have picked this, people may have picked this up. And in the argument about how long you, do you wait before you cut, and then the, the, the venerable, the kind of spirit of the English landscape yes. <laughs> says, bloody capitalists. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. And, I and um, yeah. uh, because, and, and this does not make it a socialist <laughs> radical film one iota. It is, it, it, what it is, is um, an agrarian mm. mistrust of, of money coming from the, you know, yeah. it's, it's a kind of, it's a very interesting politic. But there's a hint of Morris's news from nowhere yeah. at that moment. The idea that you know, if you if you journey far enough up the Thames Valley, you can get back into a sort of world in which the the, the workman and his products are not alienated, and that you know that 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 moment with the with the wheelwright mm. and the perfect wheel being made, and, and everyone mm. knowing the skills, mm. that is a kind of Morrisian moment. And Kipling. And Kipling, right? And Kipling. Well, who were too. very closely connected very, through that's Burn right. Jones. And, yeah. That's right. And it is, it's interesting that the. Um, the class politics, I think, play out as town and country yes. here. Yes. In a yes. way, if you if yes. you think about um, another war film, Millions Like Us, um, about women coming from all kinds of different social backgrounds. So you have the Welsh miner's daughter, the sort of London socialite, the Lancashire lass, and they all sort of come together and become friends at the end. And there's there's not really any discussion of class here in a you know. And I think that's really what the sort of angry young men films are getting at the end that actually class really did matter in the war, particularly in the room at the top, you have Joe's sort of distrust of um, someone who he fought with in the war, but because he was an Oxford educated, um, sort of much higher ranking person, you know, these, these kind of antagonisms were there and are just completely effaced. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, please. I, I, I just had a thought on a completely different track and it's because I've been talking to some people through the day about American isolationism mm -hmm. and what had to be overcome. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the earlier film that they had done, which was designed to, to mm -hmm. you know, overcome that in the United States. So I was struck in a film made in 1944, when you think this would be a dead issue, that they lash out mm -hmm. at the isolationists and have yeah. the sergeant say that, oh, well, you know, they've been put in the wrong, you know, not, they're no longer uh, uh, having any voice. But 
if that were true, you wouldn't have to put that line in the movie. And <laughs> so I was interested in the thoughts of all of you who are, you know, much closer to this material about the lingering, you know, specter of um, of American isolationism and German American and Irish American lack of sympathy for the support for Britain. Picture Post put um, a picture of Joseph Kennedy on the front. Um, uh, and uh, the caption was, a true friend to Britain. And, of course, people, what people did not know <laughs> was the briefings he's giving to uh, Roosevelt um, and, and the very important role he's playing in the isolationist camp, uh, a defeatist camp. So maybe, maybe the English were more anxious about, well, maybe these guys are going to peel away and leave us on our own in a moment, and, and I don't know. So you showed the Life magazine cover of the, of the girl in the hospital bed. Mm. What was that, 42? No, that's, that's beginning of 41 or even mm. late 40, I think. Yeah, so that would be in the first wave of, you know, cementing American support yes. for Britain. Yes. Using, you know, a time-honored way of uh, propagandizing for that. Mm. There's actually something of a range of movies um, right at the end of the war and the very beginning of the post-war period about the ongoing tensions in Anglo-American relations kind of on the ground. People fighting over girls, the, the you know, they're dating our women. And in a way, you could say maybe the question of isolationism, it's being recast as, you know, it's sort of dueling provincialisms, but British provincialism has a lot more immediate depth than American provincialism, although even American provincialism turns out to have its noble moments and, uh, you know, that has a pioneering spirit. It also understands the spirituality of trees. You know, it, it's got its own pantheistic elements, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, it seems to me the, the wheelwright scene mm -hmm. is absolutely about yeah. securing that, though it is an odd failure of continuity there that the, the dinner with the wheelwright never occurs. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's also interesting thinking about that little conversation about the least lend, um, that, because yeah. that's nestled in the children's battle scene. I wonder if that was also cut for the American yeah. release, and I don't, I don't know. That would be interesting. Um, well, I like you to join me in thanking my fellow panelists. Um, this has been a really, really interesting discussion. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, and I think before we all depart, it will be a great moment to actually to thank all the speakers in this remarkably coherent and also enjoyable and collegial uh, mm -hmm. conference, and to thank Eric and Tatiana for the idea and Sophie for joining the team and delivering the idea so beautifully <laughs> to us and with such uh, such a lack of a single glitch through the whole the whole uh, series of events so well it's, it's too late now to have a glitch so uh, no but th thank you all and, and thanks to our two great keynote speakers yeah. as well Cecile and David really really appreciate uh, all of you coming thank you, thank you.